have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Amen. 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 Please be seated. There must be a great coffee hour today or something. <laughs> On August 28, 1982, I was ordained into the Roman Catholic priesthood on the feast day of St. Augustine. The words of that prayer I just read are Augustine's words, and they summarize the ultimate goal of our pilgrimage journey together, to find our fulfillment in God. Those people and places where we encounter our fulfillment in God in the Celtic approach to Christian discipleship are known as thin places. Thin places. Where the veil between heaven and earth is so thin that the kingdom of God can easily break through. So today, I want to talk about thin places. Now I know what you're thinking. It seems a bit disingenuous that I fed you for 23 and a half years and then talk about anything thin. <laughs> but here we are. Today's emotional. Because we've been on a pilgrimage journey together here and have encountered God together here. St. Joseph's is our thin place. In the words of one of my favorite poets, T.S. Eliot, when speaking of thin pilgrimage places, writes this, you are not here to verify, instruct yourself, or inform curiosity or carry report. You are here to kneel where prayer has been valid. Prayer has and is and will continue to be valid here. It's like Joseph and Mary and Jesus in that reading from Luke today. They went up to the temple for the festival every year. We don't think of it often, but Jesus was presented in the temple as an infant, their thin place, and he went back every year. When Joseph found Jesus in the temple, it must have been one of those real God moments, literally, when Joseph realized, of course he's in the temple. It's our thin place. We've taught him to make it his in place, so it's natural that that's where he went. So today, I want to acknowledge and highlight some of our thin places together. Now it's difficult to choose what to share and who to mention, so I made a decision. Today, I'm mainly going to talk about dead people who've gone to heaven, so that no one here will be upset that they didn't make the cut. <laughs> Mary Allenson. Mary was a legend. She led the altar guild here for years. She had some quirks about her. She came into our early service every Sunday and counted five pews down and went in on the aisle on the left side. It was such a habit for her that when we were redoing the church and we relocated worship to the parish hall, the first Sunday she came in and she counted five pews from the back and sat on the aisle. It was her thin place. Harry McDaniel and I used to work together a lot with projects here in the church and beyond. And Mary was an interesting character because she hid things and didn't want us to know where they were because she thought the priest might lose it. 
So we had to get a screwdriver to fix one of these rails. And we came in, and we went in, and Mary said, now turn around, because she didn't want us to see where the screwdriver was hiding. <laughs> what a dedicated servant, though, she was. Shortly after, I became rector here. I was standing in this church when it started to rain. And the altar guild, led by Mary, started running around the church, placing buckets in strategic places. When I asked what they were doing, she said, well, that's where the water's going to come down from the roof leaks. And it did. <laughs> Encountering this several times, I asked Father Michael Cassell, the former rector, to take me on a tour of this leaky church. And he pointed to several areas around the church. And he said to each one, one was over there, oh, that leak was here when I arrived here 16 years ago. <laughs> that one over there, see the waterfall coming down? Yep, same waterfall 16 years ago. Wow. I started to think about 16 years of a leaky roof. And that's not good. So the vest bit the bullet and they found the funds to replace the roof. One day, the project begins. Mary runs into my office and says, Father Marty, Father Marty, it's raining sand in the church. <laughs> so we come over here to the church to discover that when the outermost tiles of the church were removed, the tar paper underneath the tiles, not anymore, and even the wood beneath in many places was gone. Some places this is what was left. Other places this. Other places you could see where it had just deteriorated where the nails had been. There were places in the roof five feet by five feet that the only thing that was holding that roof up was the collective pressure of those bricks, one against the other. Now family, don't run for the exits. We fixed it a long time ago. <laughs> but think about that. The power of water dripping over time. 16 plus years. The power of water. Is that not what our baptism is all about? Is that not why we pour water on the foreheads of infants in our church family? Because we know that growing up in this thin place, surrounded by a loving church community, the power of that water will enable those thin place encounters with God to continue and continue and continue over the lifetime of our pilgrimage journey. In 98, I was received into the Episcopal priesthood in this thin place. Fred Masterman, some of you may know, who was the canon to the ordinary on the bishop's staff at that time, he came and he delivered the sermon for that particular service. And he wanted to use an image about what it meant to be called as a priest. And so, Fred, in his creativity, said that you are the pinata priest. <laughs> you know how a pinata works. You hit it with a stick until it breaks open and it spills forth treats for all to enjoy. Now we're not gonna do that today, it's too much to clean up. But in light of that image, perhaps this is what our relationship is meant to be. To be broken open so that the wood can fall forth and letting the light of the kingdom in.
Put simply, we have experience blowing the roof off this place and letting the kingdom in. Now, our dear departed friend, Paul Condrus, who's gone to heaven, I know he's watching us today on Facebook Live in Heaven. <laughs> I could never give a sermon without having a joke in it for Paul's benefit. So here's today's joke. A priest, a singer, and a chef walk into a bar. <laughs> then I sat down and ordered a drink. <laughs> You have enabled me in these years to break open my gifts, and in turn, you have been so willing to break open your own. And in so doing, we have found those thin places together in the power of that baptismal water. St. Joseph is a model for the laity as the primary ministers of our church, as the prayer book says. And I'm grateful for that. Part of the vocation of a priest is to pronounce the blessing, not just at the end of the service, but to help us see where God is breaking through those thin places in our daily lives. And I think with everyone who has been called, not to a job, but to a ministry at this place, we have found those thin places together. The priest's vocation is to administer the sacraments, those milestone moments in our lives where we recognize God coming down and breaking through and we are marked, transformed. It's the thin place of a Justin Fox Hall. Having seen some of his fellow pilgrims to be youth be some of the first to be baptized when I arrived here, bursting into the sacristy and excitingly exclaiming, I want to be baptized. And we experience God breaking through. It's the faith of a people like Herb Collins. We put up the slide, please. Herb still holds the record for taking Episcopal 101 ten times. <laughs> he weekly took the Palm Trans shuttle when he could no longer drive to be here. And when he could no longer walk on his own, insisted, insisted on struggling his way with a cane and later with a walker to receive communion at this rail. And we experienced God breaking through. It's the dedication of a Pat Shanley, who tirelessly worked with her to run our coffee hour every Sunday. Grilled bagels. Pat wrote the book on those. There was a particular Sunday when Pat had taken a fall in her house. She went to the emergency room at Bethesda Hospital nearby. But before she went home, she came to St. Joseph's. <laughs> and she left a note. I got the note here. At 4.20 a.m., she writes, Dear Coffee Hour friends, I just have to take a sick day today. I've been in the emergency room at Bethesda because of a stupid accident last night. I was setting up bill payments when the phone rang. In my rush, I tangled my legs with one of the chairs, took a header, and hit my head on the vertical of the kitchen cupboard. Don't try to grill the bagels, just cut them and put them out. There's muffins also and other goodies, which the daughters of the king save for coffee hour. Sorry to let you down. <laughs> now, here's the kicker to the story. She's walking to her car in the parking lot, nobody knowing what has transpired, and Mary Naughton, Rev. Mary, meets her. And Mary knew that Pat had gone to the hospital, so it's like, what are you doing here today? Now, Mary's an ex-Roman Catholic nun, as was Pat. And Pat turns to Mary and says, you were in the convent, you know what it's like, suck it up, sister, and carry on. <laughs> Well, 
What a saint. It's the thin place of a Wendy Tobias, entering the priest's sacristy one day and through her tears saying, I think I'm called to be ordained. And we've experienced God breaking through ever since. It's the thin place of a John Weston experiencing some sort of blindness and then the act of receiving communion at the rail to my right suddenly gets this excited look on his face because somehow God broke through and he could see again. We experience God breaking through. It's the blind phone call received when the voice at the other end introduces himself and says, I'm your new organist. <laughs> and the intervening years show that the gift of David Clio Morris is so much more and a giver of so many blessings. And to this day, we continue to experience God Amen. breaking through. Next slide. It's the thin place of gathering into a crowded hospital room in Bethesda with three generations of the Sedaris Russell family, where Gay and John were to renew their marriage vows for their 52nd wedding anniversary. And because John was on his way to heaven and could no longer speak, his children and his grandchildren recited his part for the wedding vows. And God broke through. It's the sacred thin place of driving a repentant person to serve their time in federal prison and huddled on the parking lot outside the entrance gate, laying hands and anointing before he surrenders himself to serve his time. Next slide, and on the very next day, being able to gather with Catherine McLeod and her terminally ill husband, Bob McLeod, on the porch of their North Carolina home with their gathered children and grandchildren to celebrate Eucharist together for one last time. And all the family being able to lay hands upon him together as I anointed him and each person in turn able to share how much they loved him. <coughs> and God broke through. Next slide. It's the sacred thin place of George and Marie Putnam. Marie, one of our loyal altar ministers in the waning days of the former Rite 1 7.45 a.m. service, who would always lead Father William and me out of the sacristy. Her dry wit and timing were impeccable. One particular day with a single digit turnout in the congregation, Marie opened the sacristy door for us to begin the service. She took a look at the few people who were there, turned to look at William and me and said, well, if a fight breaks out, we stand a pretty good chance. <laughs> and then solemnly walked out while William and I can't hold it together. <laughs> Before we redesigned the sanctuary, there were irregular steps everywhere. Bishop Friday was here and tripped, almost broke his neck. And shortly thereafter, Marie was serving on the altar with her husband in the congregation. She tripped, almost broke her back. Well, the next day, George appears in my office with a big check. And he said, fix that. And so the sanctuary renovation began. Next slide. And it was quite a process. But George made one request. He said he wanted no one to be aware while he was alive of his donation. But he wanted a brass engraved plate, next slide, 
to be buried in the concrete underneath the tile that designated that the sanctuary renovation was in honor of the 40th wedding anniversary of George and Marie Potter. When the renovation was complete, Father William and I stood directly above where that glass plate was buried. And George and Marie renewed the vows for their 40-year marriage. And ever since then, this is why I always stand here when we share the peace. We experienced and we continue to experience God breaking through. So many ways. Ruby Van Roy. Next slide. After whom our parish hall is named because she gifted the funds to build it. She led the women's group who fashioned all these incredible pillows that adorn our sanctuary and communion rail. Next slide. It was a four-year project that they completed in less than two years. Now, when Ruby heard of our plan to redo the sanctuary, she asked for a meeting with me. And she said, you are going to keep those pillows, aren't you, Father Marty? <laughs> oh, yes, Ruby. Oh, yes, of course. And so our resident artist, Father William, worked with me to help to design the configuration of this communion rail, probably the only one in the world that was fashioned based on accommodating the pillows. <laughs> Ruby was a competitive ballroom dancer. She lived to be 107. The Braithwaites are here who took such good care of her. Thank you. So she competed in dancing into her late 90s, oftentimes winning in her age group because she was the only one in the <laughs> But she was quite good. If we could try to get that first video, this clip of the play, it could work. This was late into her 90s. We were at a Valentine's dinner dance that we held in the gymnasium. And she did this special version of Santa Lucia, dancing with her partner, Tommy. Even when she could no longer speak, she would once in a while be brought to the unplugged service 
and she would be in that second pew and you could see her tapping her feet to the music. When I came to St. Joseph, I started cottage meetings at people's homes to solicit hopes and dreams for our future together. When Ruby noticed that most of them were at night, she said she wanted to host one during the day. Many thoughts were shared by many at that meeting, as I recall, but I do remember this. There was a hush when the Ruby was going to speak. <laughs> and she simply said, well, you got to do something around here because the same old thing isn't going to work anymore. Stewardship. We had a saint by the name of Barbara Weston. During our capital campaign some years ago, Make Room at the Inn, we asked people to find ways they could give sacrificially to the campaign. Barbara basically worked for minimum wage at Walgreens, but she took her stewardship seriously. She was so excited when she figured out what she could do, and she gave us this testimony. My name is Barbara Wesson. I currently work at Walgreens as a service clerk. I moved to Florida from New Hampshire approximately two and a half years ago and have been attending St. Joseph's for about two years. Recently, Father Martin explained how he and his family could make a commitment for the capital campaign and asked all of us to do the same. Initially, I was puzzled as to how I could give much of anything. My first thought after thinking it over was I could win it by going to Dunkin' Donuts two months a week, taking about five dollars per week, 52 weeks a year, times three years, that comes to 780 dollars. I am still looking for ways to increase my commitment. I am making a commitment because St. Joseph's has given me and continues to give me much in support and caring, and I want to pass it along to others. Thank you. A lesson that Barbara gifted us with is similar to that of the widow's might in the gospel. It's not the amount of dollars that we give to God, but it's the spirit in which it is given, expecting nothing in return. Giving not from our abundance, but sacrificial giving for the sake of something greater. Barbara became known to regular Walgreens visitors because every time she finished scanning your purchases and you were walking out the door, she'd say to every person, have a blessed day. About six months after Barbara's funeral, I happened to be back at Walgreens. And a person I did not know checked me out and as I'm walking out said, have a blessed day. Taken aback a bit, I walked back and said, did you know Barbara Weston? Oh yes, she said, a bit of a legend here. In her honor, I decided to say what she used to say to everyone leaving here. Have a blessed day. Barbara's legacy was creating a thin place where you felt the presence of God all around. We experienced God breaking through. I could go on and on and on. All of us have special ones and times where we have experienced God breaking through in our lives, and we know God is there. So to borrow a line from Mr. Rogers, would you just take along with me 11 seconds to think of the people and events who have helped you see God's presence breaking through in your life. 11 seconds.
And as Mr. Rogers would say, whomever and whatever you've been thinking about, how pleased they must feel to know what they have meant to you on your journey. My heart is full of that pleasure. When I spend those 11 seconds, I think of this. In 1998, a three-year-old Demery carried our wedding photo up to this altar. One of the symbols of what we bring to ministry. It was a special moment, and especially for what followed. We could try to get that video to play in Greece. <laughs> <laughs> it was special not because of what's about to happen when she hands it to her sister Bree but then hightails it down the main aisle of the church <laughs> <laughs> because back there awaiting her are her two grandmothers my mom Mary and Dee's mom, mommy, died. Because they were coming up together. Processing up the bread and the wine for our Eucharist. They gathered in the front and surrounded by Bree and Demery and the other youth dancers, elevated the bread and the wine for our Eucharist that day. What a symbol of the incredible reality of the communion of saints gathered here every time we celebrate Eucharist. You know, every Thanksgiving sermon, I gave out a five pound Hershey's chocolate bar, <laughs> trying to find someone I did not know to whom to gift it, symbolizing that unconditional total love that God gives to each one of us, not because of anything we do, but just because God's nature is to love. There's no five pound chocolate bar today, but Perhaps my assistant, perhaps the appropriate image is this, that when we're allowed to be that pinata broken open, yes. it's the unconditional love of God that will break through. That's good. <laughs> Just like we rehearsed. <laughs> when I arrived here on March 11, 2001, I borrowed a pair of Father Mike Cassell's, I think size 13, huge shoes. I pointed out that I would never attempt to fill them, nor would it be fair to expect me to do so. So, I don't leave these behind. And I've got a new pair, thanks to you all last night. If you continue to open your hearts to what the God who is in charge dreams for you the next 23 and a half years will be even more exciting than these that we've shared and who knows you might just raise the roof off of this in place
I pilgrimage on. And so do you. At the unplugged service today, the band's going to sing a song that I wrote based on Paul's Corinthians passage about love. And the closing words are like this. Though our pilgrimage paths may change, what matters remains. And with love, we'll lack nothing. Nothing at all. <laughs>